The Sakura Gaka Festival was coming to an end, so the students had to clean up all the trash. They threw the bags into a pile and mockingly ordered the school janitor, Karando Hasebi, to do the sorting. He objected that the students should do it themselves, since that was what the assembly had decided. Karando urged them to follow the rules, but the group leader explained that the others were busy preparing for the night festival and had other things to do. The janitor said that the rules were made up for a reason, so the students should have seen it coming, but he was told to shut up and not to talk to them at all. With anger, Corando crumpled a plastic bottle, but suddenly a huge portal appeared, and all the students of the school found themselves in some strange empty world. A huge butterfly appeared in front of them, and then a voice was heard announcing that, unfortunately, for all of them, they had been summoned. Among them are both geniuses and fools, but none will return back to their world. In the new one, both humans and other creatures have much more power, so everyone will be helpless here. Nevertheless, they will be given a bit of power. They will be able to understand language. Their bodies will change, and they will be given a blade, which has already appeared in the hands of some students. Lastly, the summoned were advised to remember what they regret with all their hearts, for it might help. Corando noticed that the disciples began to disappear, dissolving into a black haze. Suddenly, some guy rushed past. He pushed the janitor away, grabbing his blade. Corando realized with horror that now he would die without his sword. He tried to shout to the insolent man, but he also disappeared. Corando kept shouting for his sword to be returned, but a man just before he disappeared explained that the thief was Hayato Ichihara, the son of some big shot, proud and rude. In other words, a very bad guy. At last, he concluded that this contract worker had taken a big hit. The students still kept disappearing, and the voice kept repeating that everyone was helpless in the new world, and no one would come to save them. Corando came to the conclusion that he would simply die at this rate. He got very angry from realizing that once again all the worst was getting to him. The guy himself started to fade away, questioning why exactly he had to die. Either way, he wouldn't have to socialize with people anymore. If he was going to show up anywhere, Corando preferred that place to be the snowy mountains or the desert. He really wants to go somewhere where there are no people. Corando just wants to live. His wish seems to have come true, considering he was tossed into the mountains. Which, by the way, had a massive storm blowing in them. Corando couldn't even really look around. He just walked forward. Suddenly, the huge figure of a snow leopard loomed on the hill. The boy immediately remembered the words of the mysterious voice that all the creatures of the new world would be much stronger than the students. However, at this rate, he was more likely to die of cold. Corando reached some sort of cave, with a pouch lying at the entrance. The only thing inside was a book, but the only thing that could be warmed with it was a brain. It occurred to Corando for a second that this book might contain information on how to start a fire. Despite the incomprehensible letters, the boy found that he could read it. To his great surprise, the book was not simple at all. It contained spells, Having read out one of them, Corando assumed that it would help to block the entrance. He decided to try it and did as written. Corando had time to notice the ground rising, but suddenly slumped to the ground, feeling the strength leave his body. Before he lost consciousness, the guy managed to see the same figure of a snow leopard approaching the cave. The leopard opened its huge maw, and instead of half of it, the entrance to the cave was completely overgrown. Suddenly, something began to rise from under the snow below. Finally, the snowdrift broke up and many eyes appeared. Corando woke up and struggling to get to his feet, found that the entrance to the cave was closed. He couldn't believe that he had done it with magic or even that there was magic in this world. The boy carefully picked up the book from the floor, realizing that he was all alone in the mountains, just as he wanted to be. In that case, it was time to begin. Corando decided that he would never die here and did not even realize that at this very moment, his new home was guarded by a snow leopard. After reading the book, he learned that there are many spirits in this world. Fire, water, earth, wind, thunder. The person using the spell calls upon these spirits to get what he wants in exchange for magical power. This kind of magic is called spiritual magic. Corando still couldn't believe. He understood the text, despite the incomprehensible letters he was seeing for the first time in his life. An unexpected sneeze made him remember to warm up immediately, and a flame spell came to mind. Corando thrust his hand forward, but slumped to the ground again, though he did not lose consciousness. The book said that if the mage was inexperienced, he could improperly transfer magical power to the spirit so that it would simply be sucked out. The outflow of magic must be blocked. If this is not done, the mage will suffer from headaches. 
unconsciousness, fatigue, and muscle aches. However, repeated attempts will help to better feel the spirits around and understand their own strength. The reserve of magical power could also grow. Corando began to try again and again, but each time he failed. He didn't understand what was wrong with this world, but he could create a wall. Although he assumed that he was not strong enough for this spell, suddenly his stomach rumbled loudly. So Corando decided it was time to look for food. He looked into the sack and pulled out a loaf of bread, which he greedily pounced on. From there, he also pulled out a barrel, the contents of which he poured inside in an instant. He assumed that there must be something else inside and began pulling out one loaf after another. Soon a whole mountain of bread and kegs had accumulated against the wall, along with a small knife. Even despite the quantity, these supplies would last for a year at most. Corando continued throwing spells, but again flew off without getting what he wanted. The leopard watched his efforts with interest. Finally, he managed to create a small candle, which he held as gently as if it were his own child. The place was a bit unfamiliar, but Corando was determined that he would not die, even if all the creatures of the new world turned on him. He eagerly leafed through the pages of the book, learning new spells, and soon the interior of the cave had a stone table, shelves, and even a toilet. It thus passed 181 days. Today was unusually quiet, which made Corando assume that the storm had subsided. He armed himself with a knife and trimmed his overgrown beard, then opened the door to the outside. The storm had indeed stopped, so Corando was finally able to enjoy the beauty of the new world. Here, there was no need to think about a paycheck, false sense of self-worth or oppressive inferiority. In this world, one should live simply for the sake of living. The boy's attention was attracted by the snow leopard, which now could be clearly seen. According to the information in the book, it was one of the magical beasts. Creatures like him gained magical power by fusing their own life force and spirits. Such beasts are the opposite of monsters, which in turn are the result of a failed spirit transformation. Either way, if it were a monster, Corando would have to say goodbye to his life. The boy walked on. His body felt so light, but he thought it was the effect of being locked up for so long. Suddenly, the snowdrift beneath his feet fell down and Corando himself fought. Despite the great height, he quickly jumped to his feet and ran forward, amazed at how fast he could move his legs. He accelerated so fast that he didn't have time to slow down and crashed into the rock that had appeared so suddenly. He was running uphill, but he wasn't out of breath. He crashed into the mountain at speed, but there wasn't even a scratch. As he climbed up, he noticed the leopard staring at him strangely. Corando promised that one day he would tie the beast's tail in a knot. Suddenly, an interesting thought occurred to him. The boy looked at his fist and then struck the rock with force, finding himself upside down in the snow. However, what caught his attention was the dent that was left at the sight of the blow. Corando rejoiced that with such strength, he could now even hunt rodents and rabbits. He was already lost in the anticipation of meat, as suddenly he saw a huge spider on top, which hurriedly jumped down, almost crushing the guy. Corando couldn't understand why this thing was so gigantic, but there was no time to think. He had to run before the spider ate him. The boy took off, but almost immediately he stumbled and just rolled forward. He had already prepared for death as a leopard jumped on the monster and, tearing off the head of the spider, ran into the cave occupied by Corando. He tried to stop the beast, but as he ran after it, he discovered that there was another passage in the cave. Suddenly, a tail appeared from the cave, with which the leopard caught the boy and dragged him inside, pulling him right up to its huge maw. Suddenly, on the top of the leopard's head appeared his, or, based on the situation, rather, her cub. The beast began to scowl at the new guest, but suddenly its mother curled her tail and pressed the guy against her own body causing Corando to sink into the fur. He decided to run before they let him forage, but he was incredibly warm right now. The young mage couldn't even remember the last time he felt this warm. Corando woke up in the morning and saw only the cub in front of him, who continued to stare at the man in disbelief. He asked the cub where his mother was, but on rising to his feet, he found that the cave was very large. Down below lay iced animals and monsters, apparently supplies for the winter. Corando went to the exit and saw a leopard in the sky. It turns out that she can also fly. By the way, there was another portion of supplies on its tail. He went to his part of the room, but suddenly he noticed the predator opening the passage to his warehouse. So he assumed that she had created that wall as well. In that case, he didn't understand why had she also stocked it as food. In fact, while he was thinking, the leopard had already flown in for a new batch of supplies. 
Corando continued to study the book, and the mother began to wash her child. The bars walked to the exit and gazed into the distance, and the beast followed her, stepping over the guest of her den. He began to play with his mother, but suddenly she threw him to the boy, who deftly caught the cub, and then sealed the entrance to the cave again. Suddenly there was an explosion outside, to the source of which the mistress of the cave flew. Corando realized that the only creature that could do such a thing was a man. He was right. On the mountainside appeared a human troop, headed by a bearded man. Seeing the leopard in front of him, he ordered to open fire. The leopard dodged several explosions, deftly bouncing aside. As the predator was too fast, the archers were ordered to move back. The mage managed to create a protective circle before the enemy caused a powerful ice wave that shook even the leader of the squad. The man realized that the leopard had used ice cover. However, he had expected nothing less from the white ghost of the Allergerian Mount. All of this incredible battle was taking place right before Corando's eyes. Though this brainchild was more like a painting, he faced the harsh reality he had come to know back in his world. Society didn't recognize Corando, and even when he was summoned, the sword he needed to survive was simply stolen. That was exactly what the harsh reality was. The boy didn't understand why even that hairball next to him wasn't running away, but willing to join the fight. Right now, the beast had no strength, so it remains just to watch. That being the case, Corando decided he wouldn't run away either. There was no way he would now tear his gaze away and run away from reality like he had done before. Meanwhile, his mother tried to attack the leader of the group, but he hit the predator with his shield, with such force that she even flew to the edge of the cliff. Suddenly, a powerful spell was used against the leopard, and her support collapsed downwards. But the beast stayed on its feet. The subordinates tried to inform the captain that the animal was still alive, but they were ordered to be silent. The white ghost of the Allerdurian Mountains was dead. The mysterious hooded figure announced. The captain noticed that it was very dangerous, and therefore thanked the savior, thanks to which it was possible to defeat the predator without losses. The man praised the lady heroine, who meanwhile exposed her beautiful face for a good job. Maxim Dahl, a giant and captain of the White Spear hunting team, remarked that he hadn't hunted in over 50 years, so he admitted that this snow leopard was very important to him. However, he couldn't understand why the heroine of the kingdom had such a sad look. Akari apologized to him, explaining that all she did during the hunt was run away. Corando, still watching from the cave, saw the girl's face as very familiar, though her clothes were obviously different. The boy came to the conclusion that the other students might be somewhere nearby as well. Corando wondered if he could talk to her with the help of the wind spirits. Maxim told him that it was only possible to challenge this beast after three days of the harsh winter. That was why even the fact that Akari had decided to join the squad was commendable. Her spirit gift ability, although the giant himself would prefer to call it a blessing from God, seemed to the captain to be a very useful thing, because every hunter wants to know at least the approximate location of his prey. Akari admitted that her ability wasn't really that special. When using it, the brain analyzes the terrain and makes an approximate map, where the owner herself is always displayed in the center, and hostile creatures are marked in red. However, this skill is not the most stable, so it does not always mark enemies correctly. Sometimes even harmless meadow rabbits were marked red. The guy found what he heard extremely interesting. Maxim said that if you can't use your skills perfectly, you should He told him that everyone here was strong. Suddenly, the man turned to his comrades and shouted whether everyone had recovered. Dahl said it was time to come down from the mountains, reminding them that there was good booze and beautiful maidens waiting for them in town. The others did not object and rose obediently from their seats. Akari didn't understand why this giant was acting like a medieval sailor. The girl asked the captain not to make such a thoughtful face and reported the unnatural behavior of the wind spirits, as well as the fact that there was someone in the cave opposite someone who was marked in red. In any case, Maxim declared that it was not their concern now. The mages approached the corpse of the huge beast and, lifting the one up, carried it along. The cub was watching all of this. He tried to jump down, but Corando told him to stop and suggested that they get out of here. The animal fell to the ground at the very precipice, so the boy picked it up in his arms and carried it back to the dwelling. There he wrapped it in his towel and jacket and began to prepare supper. He ate the meat he had not tasted in so long. However, there was still the baby to feed. The little raptor was so small that he couldn't even eat meat yet. But at this rate, he was afraid the cub would starve to death. 
Corando thought for a moment, and then he made a pot out of the earth, poured in some water, and put it on the fire. Then he crumbled some bread into it, and, after a little while, it was a good chowder. The boy waited until the dish cooled down and began to feed the baby. Surprisingly, the beast was eating the porridge with gusto, so Corando decided that he would feed it until it could eat meat. But there was something he couldn't understand. The leopard had really entrusted her child to a human. A few days later, the baby was already frolicking, smashing the dishes of the dwelling. Curando asked him to quiet down, but he realized that it was uncomfortable without a name. He picked the baby up in his arms, trying to see if it was a boy or a girl, but nothing came out. In that case, he named the baby Yukishiro. Thus began their life together. The baby continued to play, eat, and learn about the world. The short summer flew by in the blink of an eye, and they survived the second winter. Spring came, and with it, the cub became a predator. Yukishiro jumped down, showing his prey to his friend. Kurando wondered why it was so small this time, for which he received a tail on his face. Suddenly, the leopard came to the edge of the cliff and began to watch something intently. Approaching him, the guy realized the reason for the restlessness. People came again. However, this time the giant was not among them, so Kurando assumed that it was another group. Noticing a familiar face, he decided to try to use the wind spirits again. The new leader, Saldometer Bragwai, ordered his subordinates to move faster and to pick up the corpses of their comrades on the way back. He turned to Akari, asking if she had found the snow leopard yet. Saul thought she was just a coward from the kingdom of Lorin. The young man explained that these lands had once belonged to the land of Dalgan, where its subjects hunted monsters. They were true hunters. That was the pride of Dalgan. His comrades immediately picked up his fighting spirit and began to praise the leader, chanting that the people of Lorien were fit only to follow. Akari didn't understand why this ability went to her. If she failed, she was laughed at, and if she succeeded, she was maligned. Back in school, it was as if the other students didn't notice her. In this world, people like her are called heroes, but in reality, they're just being used. Akari is tired of it all, because there is almost no difference between the old world and the new one. Meanwhile, the friends returned to their cave. Yukishiro brought a comb to his roommate, suggesting that it was time to start the procedure, and Kurando concluded that people really do hunt snow leopards every year. In fact, living with Yukishiro, the lad had learned a lot. There is always a blizzard in these mountains in winter, so no one comes here. In the short summer, spiders crawl out looking for prey, so people won't come here at this time of year either. The territories of snow leopards and spiders are clearly distributed. The proof is that spiders never climb high, but they can be forced to wake up and then they come out in the harsh winter for three days. So if you hold out for that time, the hunters won't be here until next year. However, the snow leopard camouflage, as well as the geographical advantage, is of no use as long as these people have a heroine with such abilities. These people killed Yukashiro's mom. Even she didn't have the strength. Kurando suggested that traps should be set, though he immediately discarded the idea, since an experienced hunter would not be caught by an amateur like him. On the contrary, it would be easier to find them, and that would be the end of everything. The power will not work either, as the guy does not control it well. Even with the onset of darkness to attack will not work. Suddenly, Kurando wondered why he should even care about the lives of these hunters. Yes, he is not on the side of humans or magical creatures, but he is on the side of his friend Yukishiro, and therefore he will do anything to protect the leopard. In that case, he turned to his roommate with a suggestion to wake the spiders from hibernation. The group of hunters continued on their way along the snowy peaks of the Alerdrian Mountains. Suddenly, the figure of a snow leopard flashed on the hill above, which pleased Sol. Although the look of the magical beast seemed a bit strange to him, the leader ordered to open fire immediately, and soon there was a powerful explosion at the place where the leopard was sitting. Sol was incredibly happy about his quick success and repeated to his subordinates that Dalgan had the best hunters in the world. At the same moment, snow fell from the hill and a huge spider emerged from underneath. Sol could not believe that it was a trap and that some beast had led them, the hunters of the Dalgan kingdom. He shouted that he was smarter than some animal, grabbed his bow and launched an arrow straight at the spider's head, despite his assistant's warnings not to provoke such a strong monster. The spider jumped up on its hind legs and then swung its limbs, easily severing the heads of several fighters. The others began to scatter away, and the mage said they would all be wiped out at this rate, but Sol shushed the sluggish hunter, ordering the others to retreat. For now, there were those who would hold the monster back. Nonetheless, Akari stopped right in front of the spider, 
glaring at its huge fangs that were coming at the girl right now. The only thing she wanted to do right now was go home. Kernedo cheerfully greeted his friend, who, however, had not returned to the cave alone. The boy lifted his guest into his arms, remembering that she was almost the only one who had mistaken him for a human while working as a janitor at the school. He noticed that Ikari had grown a bit, though she still looked a bit emaciated. The girl soon woke up to find the young man in front of her gently brushing a huge snow leopard. Akari wondered where she was now, but then remembered the huge spider herself. She wondered if it was a snow leopard, but she was even more interested in the janitor, whom she recognized immediately. Kurando made a fire, so Akari wondered where he had learned magic, but answered her own question again, remembering the spell book. The owner of the dwelling told her that it had been brought by a snow leopard. The girl did not understand why the beast did it, but Kurando admitted that he also did not know the reasons for such an act. After all, they came here to kill. Akari's eyes opened wide with surprise, but the guy asked not to be surprised, explaining that he saw and heard everything. In that case, the girl assumed that he was the one marked in red in that cave last year as well. Kurando admitted that he was aware of the ability too, noting that it was also the reason the hunters had come this year. In that case, Akari assumed that the spider had also been released by her interlocutor. Unexpectedly, Kurando confessed that he often thought of Japan. He apologized for such an abrupt change of topic. After all, it had been a long time since he had talked to people. The boy explained that if you and your companion run into people with obviously not good intentions, it is much easier to escape alone. The thing is, when there are two of you, each of you can't leave the other even though your opponent is physically superior. And now Kurando and Yukashiro find themselves in just such a situation. Their rivals are much stronger, but he can't leave his friend. And so there is nothing left but to fight back. Yukashiro's rivals are much stronger than him, but he can't leave his friend behind. So he has no choice but to fight back. Akari admitted that she didn't really understand her train of thought, but Kurando realized that he was getting a little carried away. In fact, he just wanted to say that he would do whatever was necessary to protect his friend and not let him die. The girl wondered why not just run away, but the guy explained that if he didn't fight, the hunt for Yukashiro would continue, and the leopard himself hates to run away from the battlefield. Akairi was still puzzled if it was worth the cost of human lives, even though they were hunted. But in that case, Kurando wondered if she herself would welcome with open arms guys who break into her house. She countered that, of course, she would fight back. The girl was about to say something else, but Kurando cut off that that was exactly what they were doing. Fighting back, Yukishiro stretched and stalked towards the exit. Pausing his gaze on his guest for a second, she was going over the guy's words in her head about her ability, and the fact that this year's hunters had also come just because of her. Akari assumed that if she hadn't brought Dalgan's subordinates, then it wouldn't have been the Snow Leopard or themselves, or Miss Janitor that would have been harmed. She got out of bed and followed Yukashiro to the exit, pondering that indeed everything that had happened was her fault. The girl came to the conclusion that she simply had no right to lecture her savior. After all, she might have to kill someone herself tomorrow. However, Akari would definitely not be able to do it without hesitation, like Mr. Janitor. The girl stepped outside, watching as Yukashiro rose into the air and then deftly pounced on a creature flying by, sinking his teeth into it and knocking it to the ground. Now the basic principle of this world had come to her. If you want to live, survive. Akari wondered if she would be killed too, but Kurando said she wouldn't if she kept quiet about the cave and its inhabitants, so he informed the girl that she could leave. Kurando caught himself thinking that he didn't know how to talk to children at all, though why would he ever want to? Still, he couldn't help but admit that he had turned into a crude idiot. Akari was making her way through the snow-covered hills when she suddenly came across a spider web. Because spiders are hostile, the threads are also marked in red. But she still couldn't get used to the idea that, to a janitor, humans are marked in red just as much as monsters. In fact, Akari had seen people suddenly turn red many times, which scared her a lot. It's scary when your enemy is following you everywhere, but it's even scarier when there are only enemies around. Finally, she saw the outline of a familiar city in the distance, and so there was only a short distance to go. Akari stopped in horror as the entire settlement was now glowing red. Akari sank to the ground, not knowing what to do next, but more importantly, why the whole town had turned against her. A few days later, Kurnado and Yukishiro were out for a walk again, but suddenly they came upon a barely alive girl who was walking back towards the cave. Despite her curt speech, 
Corando realized what the problem was. Of course, he hadn't been to human settlements in a long time, so this was a good opportunity. In any case, there was nothing to do, so he decided to go and find out everything there, using a spell of darkness, so that no one could see him. The giant was walking towards the exit of the establishment, as suddenly the owner suggested him to go to his country, as he was tired of looking after his guest. When he got home, Maxim sank down on the bed and poured a barrel of wine into himself. He asked the man who had followed from the tavern itself if an assassin had been sent for him, but the answer was negative. The giant said he still didn't believe it, so he received a note. Of course, he could not understand what exactly it said. However, he immediately recognized the handwriting of the heroine of the kingdom. Corando assumed that he was now believed, but the man asked not to be in a hurry. Even given that someone had come from Akari, the big man couldn't trust someone who still hadn't shown himself. Someone sneaking around in the darkness seemed to the giant to be either an assassin or a common thief. In that case, the lad dispelled the spell and let the owner of the room look at himself. Sure, the guest was a bit unkempt, but it was hardly an immigrant or a vagrant. The giant didn't sense any evil intentions either, so Corando offered to cut to the chase. He reported that Akari was safe, which pleased the man, though his face remained as impassive. The giant assumed he would have to, but still wondered what to call the sudden guest. Corando called himself John, but the interlocutor realized that the name had just been made up, though he admitted that it didn't matter. The giant introduced himself as Maxim, but warned that if he tried to deceive him, he would be killed. The boy pretended to be very frightened, which interested Dale. He could not make out what was in the boy's head. Corando asked him to tell him what was going on in the city. Maxim explained that Saul was the son of a very powerful man. He ran to a white ghost of the mountains and lost almost his entire squad. Back in the city, the bastard accused Akari of sicking the spider on her comrades on purpose. The guy's henchmen agreed, so the girl was put on the wanted list with a bounty on her head. In the land of hunters, treachery is not forgiven. Corando said that it wasn't true, and Akari should testify, but Maxim objected that it wouldn't work, because the hunters, and especially Saul's gang, had authority in this town. Maxim admitted that during the day he went to protest the guild's decision, and in the evening, he thought about how to live for tomorrow. Corando assumed that the giant was spending money on booze for the same reason, but Maxim said that alcohol was fuel for the mind. The boy wondered if everyone in the world, except the man had turned their backs on Akari, but the giant asked John who he was to her, and if he had any purpose in helping the girl. Corando replied that he simply wanted to live in peace, and so he promised that he would take Maximus to her, but in return he must forget about John's existence. But the giant objected that he didn't know who was in front of him or where he came from, so he wasn't sure that he would keep his word. Corando stated that he considered those who broke promises to be common trash. In that case, Maxim asked where Akari was, and in response he heard about the foothills of the Allergurian Mountains. The man knew that white ghosts dwelt there, and so he was greatly surprised to learn that this fellow was from those places. He looked like a hunter to Dahl, though even Dalgan's subjects couldn't handle a web of spiky spiders and travel such a long way. Well, perhaps no one except Akari. After a moment's thought, Maxim offered to leave right away, but Corando reminded him of the pile of guards outside. Soon, however, they were all lying unconscious, gathered in a neat pile at the back of the building. The giant suggested that there was no way out through the gate, so suggested jumping over. The big man used his life magic and jumped high, finding himself on the roof of the building. Maxi mockingly suggested that he look for a ladder for the boy, but he repeated the trick so well that he immediately found himself on the other side of the wall, which impressed the giant. Yukashiro looked forward to his roommate's return, but suddenly the same hunter who had killed his mother a year ago stood before his gaze. Maxim laughed at his comrade, who was already exhausted. The boy explained that it was all the fault of the amplification magic, but Dale objected. Corando still showed good results, but even so, it was very difficult to compete with the giant's strength. Suddenly, a leopard jumped out to meet them, ready to tear the intruder apart. The giant assumed it was his territory, calling him Kitten. Noticing a familiar face next to the man, Yukishiro turned around and jumped on the hill ahead. Maxim asked the boy why his pet was without a collar, but Corando advised him not to provoke the beast, for he didn't even know if the leopard had had time to eat lunch when they returned. The giant was again convinced that this was a guy with no brakes. Corando thanked him, but the big man said it was not a compliment. Upon seeing Akari, 
The man happily grabbed her in his arms, informing her that he had finally seen with his own eyes that the girl was unharmed. Remembering her character, the giant allowed Ikari to cry. She tearfully apologized for making Maximus worry, but he stated that it wasn't her fault. Corando walked over to the leopard, who was staring sadly into the distance, sitting at the edge of the cliff. He put his arm around his friend, promising that one day they would definitely kill this giant. He said that he himself had once been robbed of his clothes, but he had met Yukashiro when he was here. That was why Corando wished with all his soul to repay his friend. The beast turned his muzzle away, but upon hearing, the beast turned his muzzle away, but when he heard how stubborn he was, he pounced on his friend and playfully threw him to the ground, rubbing himself against the boy's jacket. Yukashiro grew stronger every day, and Kurando decided to practice magic. He couldn't lose his friend. The guy asked the couple if they were done chatting. Maxim wondered why they were so disheveled, but Kurando asked him to ignore it, as it was a common thing. The giant said he was going back to Lauren, so he asked him to keep an eye on Akari. Dale planned to go to the sacred office of the province. It shouldn't take long, so he promised to be back soon. Corando queried about the sacred chancery, and Akari explained that it was the place where the innocent could prove they hadn't committed a crime. Of course, there is no magic in this world that can replace a lie detector, but one heroine did manage to replace it. Akari explains that Laurent was believed by the hunters, which is why she is now a wanted woman. However, if the kingdom finds out that Dolgan's subjects are deceiving, the relationship between the two nations will be broken. It is for this reason that she needs the power of this heroine, her ability Scythe of Truth. Akari explained that such abilities are called Gift of the Spirits, or God's Blessing. When the heroine asks a question, if the person is lying, the Scyther hurts them, but if they tell the truth, they remain unharmed. Corando found this ability rather problematic. The girl agreed with that statement, especially since the Scythe of Truth only works with countries and organizations that have accepted a myriad of conditions. Akari revealed that this heroine was in her third year at the academy, so is quite a decent human being. Corando suggested that the sacred office has quite a lot of influence, and once again, he hit the mark. Even one of the major religions of the Ellipse, Sandra, accepted her, though she never once used the higher court. The giant repeated that he was going to head to the chancery, but before he did so, he warned that he'd be spending the night at John's. The boy reminded him that Maxim was in a hurry, so he was sure it would be better to go right away. But the giant explained that he couldn't get through the cobwebs now. So he hoped that Corando wouldn't leave his comrade in distress. The man was impressed by the den of the snow leopard. The owner of the dwelling created a fire, but the absence of wood surprised the guest. Maxim wondered if Corando kept the fire burning with the help of magic power. The boy confirmed that that was what the spellbook said. The giant objected that it was very inefficient but he explained that it was a way of expanding the magical reserve, though of course it was hard at first. Maxim then asked how the young man prepared food. He explained that with the help of earth spirits, he creates a pot, then burns it with fire, and then adds water. Well, and of course, one should not forget about the skewer for meat. The giant asked to be shown the whole process, and Corando did not object, doing everything according to his recipe. When the food was ready, Maxim asked Akari what they had just seen. The girl was surprised at how easily the boy could handle three spirits at once, as if he were just juggling. Nevertheless, Maxim still could not understand why he should complicate his life so much, because skewers and pots could be bought at the store, and the fire could be maintained with wood. Moreover, it was impossible to master the spirits without training. Corando pulled out a book, explaining that it was actually more of a textbook. Akari pounced on the writing with interest. She was sure that this book was probably from the Academy. The girl exclaimed that it wasn't even a textbook, but a veritable encyclopedia. Akari wondered how many times the guy had read it, since it had become so shabby. The man was surprised that Corando also fed roasted meat to the leopard, but the cave master explained that it was a magical beast after all. Tasting the chowder, Maxim confirmed that it was indeed delicious, especially the seasoning. Suddenly, the giant offered Corando to come down to the mountains and become a hunter. The man promised to put in a good word. Maxim looked at him angrily and asked him not to look at him, like as a hunter's license would allow him to visit the city, and he could help Akari by taking away her things, otherwise she would have to wear dirty clothes, but she said she was fine with that. The next morning, Corando ran into Akari again at the exit of the cave. When asked by the girl where the giant was, the boy stated that he was still sleeping and snoring heavily. 
which was very annoying. The girl apologized for the fact that her friends would have to take risks because of her. But Corando objected that it was not difficult for him to just come down from the mountains. Akari explained that after all, he did not even know her, but the guy noticed that she herself does not tell anything. In that case, the interlocutor admitted that her name is Fujishiro Akari. But here everyone just calls her Akari. Corando also introduced himself, but said that the girl could just keep calling him janitor. The boys didn't even notice Maxim standing behind them. He knew that John was a fiction. In that case, the giant asked to tell where Corando was really from, but the guy repeated that he came from the mountains. Finally, the boy offered to go and left Yukishiro in charge and asked him to watch over Ikari. He decided to bring his friend a souvenir from the city. Soon the comrades reached the city gates. Maxim shouted that he was back and ordered it to be opened. There was no reaction. He even assumed that he would have to climb through the wall again, as suddenly the gate rumbled and began to lower. Walking down the street, Corando assumed that Maxim was a very powerful man, but the giant argued that he was not, as even the slanted glances of the others in his direction indicated. The boy looked at himself again and concluded that his clothes stood out too much. The giant casually reminded him that Corando was a member of the group from the mountains that had decided to settle separately. At last, they came to the door of a tavern, and as they entered it, they again attracted the slanted glances of the customers. They went to the counter and Maxim told the young man sitting inside that he wanted to recommend a hunter. He was surprised. First, they jump over the walls, and then they come with a recommendation. Nevertheless, the administrator asked where the hunter was. The giant pointed to the one standing next to him, but the administrator objected that the face was not familiar to him. Maxim concluded that he had vouched, but still had to start all over again. But the administrator explained that since the hunter was recommended, he could skip the identity check and everything else, though he could explain everything later, if he wanted to, of course. The man held out a sheet of paper and asked Corando for his name and deposits. The guy explained that he couldn't write, so the receptionist asked him to just dictate. Maxim told him that he had met this guy of the Alurdurian Mountains when he went to look for Ikari. His whole clan had been wiped out by some magical beast, so he was the only survivor. If so, the administrator asked if he was familiar with the guild's rules and stated that an aptitude assessment was required. The giant did not object, but reminded him that Corando had been born in a mountain clan, and their children there began to survive on their own from the age of 10. Maxim led his comrade to the evaluator, and then a box was placed on the table. The giant explained that they would now be measuring innate combinability with spirits, if he remembered correctly. Of course, the old man opened the box and told him that each ring had a spirit sealed in it, and asked the lad to put them all on at once. When Corando followed the instructions, the appraiser ordered the magical power to be released. He bent over and looked closely at the rings. The highest combinability appeared to be with darkness, followed by ice, next in order were earth, water, wind, lightning, fire, and the weakest combination was with light. Though that made sense considering the highest was with dark, the assessor explained that combinations do not determine the future, but people with certain characteristics find it easier to work in a certain direction. For example, blacksmiths are helped by fire, while sailors are helped by water and wind. For hunters who work in areas with little snow cover, ice is better suited to preserve prey. The power of darkness manifests when hunting at night, but usually monsters still have an advantage at this time. The old man stated that it was a rather useless ability. The hunters watching the process started laughing and joking about such a useless combination, and they also recalled that this weirdo was recommended by the captain of the White Lance. Maxim reported that giants don't have the best combination either. Nevertheless, it was possible to use autonomous magic or learn how to skillfully handle weapons. The main thing was not to get frustrated. Finally, the evaluation was finished and the guy was asked to put the rings back where they belonged. When the box was put away, Maxim noticed the portrait of the appraiser, noting that Corando was not bad at drawing. He assumed that the guy had manipulated the shadow using darkness. The administrator asked the giant to come up for a word. Maxim warned Corando that he would step aside for a couple of minutes to discuss something regarding the recommendation. The young man was impressed by this aptitude evaluation ceremony. He supposed that if something like this were in Japan, it would be much easier for people to decide on their future. Suddenly, a group of oddly colored men appeared behind him. Their leader asked how Corando felt now that his life was over. But it seems to me that on the contrary, these ragamuffins' lives will be over. 
because they've clearly got the wrong man. What do you think? Were you interested in this story? Write your opinion about this manga in the comments. If there is good activity under this, I will gladly do a part two, where I will show our Corando in all his glory. That's all for now. See you later, and bye-bye. The big man continued to taunt the boy, saying that he had come to be a hunter, but he wouldn't get a better profession than storekeeper. Corando just turned around and went the other way without saying a word in response, but the bully grabbed him by the shoulder and then kicked him in the stomach. The guy flew into the column opposite, which finally convinced the bully of his opponent's weakness. Suddenly they noticed a giant narby, and so they did not continue the conflict and went about their business. Maxim ordered his comrade to rise to his feet, not understanding why he was pretending. Having shaken off, Corando explained that he just wanted to avoid conflict. That's why he decided not to move, though the giant reminded him that the guy could even use magic to keep alive. The administrator stated that duels between hunters were strictly forbidden, as was the use of weapons and magic on guild territory. The man advised to be more careful from now on, but Corando asked, what if you were attacked? The administrator reiterated that it was forbidden to use magic without permission, regardless of the reason, and also noted that Corando had provoked the bullies himself by, finally, the boy was handed his hunter token and asked to carry it with him at all times, as this item allowed him to use level three magic. Maxim paid attention to something else, but seeing that the administrator didn't understand what he was talking about, he himself offered his comrade to check everything in practice and take an order for herbal balls. The man asked to sign here, and remembering that Corando was not trained in literacy, offered to fill out the papers himself. But the young man explained that writing a name was quite simple and took a pen, having familiarized himself with the papers. The administrator announced that it was already possible to go to kill the grass balls, but asked him to be more careful as the reward was given only for undamaged kernels. At last, Corando asked for a copy of the document, which surprised the man because even experienced hunters usually did not ask for it, but he explained that it would be good to have proof of the order. Already on the street, Maxim concluded that Corando was no longer a hermit living in the mountains, so it could be considered that he had become closer to society, but the silent interlocutor was fascinated only by his new badge. It is labeled with ranks, more commonly referred to as stars. The lowest rank is 10 stars, and the highest is only one. In addition, Hunters who have special skills or specialize in a certain area can receive stars of other colors. For example, if a certain color is specified in the order, only the hunter with the corresponding rank can take it. Corando has 10 stars, but all of them are colorless. Maxim also has only one star directly, like a royal hunter. Holders of the highest rank are very rare, though there are rumors that the captain of the Wings of Night Clan got it in just one year. The giant came tiredly out of his house, wondering why to go so early, and Corando explained that he always got up at this time in the mountains. Maxim remarked that it was a good habit for a hunter and suggested moving out while it was crowded. Suddenly, he asked if Corando had taken the girl's things, but the man ordered him to be quiet, noting that the giant wasn't careful at all. The man announced that they should get to the hunting ground to the south. The boy was surprised to see the desert, for they hadn't even moved an hour away from the city yet. Maxim officially announced that the comrade's life as a hunter had now begun. He asked not to look at him with such a stupid look, because everyone started with hunting grass balls, though it was more like mowing, because it was a magical grass, but it didn't use magic. Corando asked if this was a dangerous task, and the giant explained that these weeds were harmless, unless, of course, the roots intertwined. The boy swung his knife and sliced the ball in two. He explained that it was a three-toed horn blade, and Maxim noticed that the fellow was a rather old-fashioned hunter. Nevertheless, this weapon never fails, for the wielder of such horns uses cutting magic for defense. Finally, Corando pulled out a small ball, assuming he was finished. Maxim confirmed that this was the core, they didn't pay much for it, but money is money. The boy inquired how much one cost, and the giant estimated that 25 pieces would get you one rod. By the way, he assumed that the interlocutor knew nothing about currency which turned out to be a correct remark. Now the giant began to question whether it had been a good idea to bring the newcomer here. He explained that kin was the basic currency and one kin was 100 selim. He pulled out his own money and demonstrated the denomination bills. Maxim held out the pouch to Corando, explaining that he simply couldn't leave Akari without the money. It was also a reward for his help. 
for the giant doubted that he would be able to get back to the mountains before the storm hit, so he asked him to keep an eye on the girl. Corando objected that he didn't need the money because he had made a promise but Maxim asked him not to be taken for a fool and expressed confidence that the boy had known Akari for a long time. Either way, he didn't care. So he just asked to keep an eye on her. Suddenly, the giant snapped out of his seat and ran off, leaving his comrade alone. Corando decided to continue mowing and soon pulled out at least a dozen cores. He was about to start the next ball when suddenly a bird attacked him from the sky and he barely managed to dodge its talons. The eagle was truly huge, and even daring to attack near the city. Corando was once again convinced how cruel the world was. Its entire body was bright blue in color, but the bird's amplification magic still couldn't be felt. The young man took out several boomerangs, also made of the three-toed horn. He had so thoughtfully brought with him, he was confident that he could hit as he had been training with Yukishiro. But his first attempt to hit the eagle at close range failed, as he simply dodged though he couldn't do any damage. Corando threw two more boomerangs at the eagle, hitting it in the back, sending it plummeting downwards, giving Yukishiro a souvenir. The townspeople watched mesmerized as someone walked down the street carrying a huge bird on his back. Corando had worn conspicuous clothing before, and now he looked like a brightly colored target. The administrator also greeted the hunter everyone was talking about with some excessive politeness, but when he realized who it was, his face changed dramatically. Suddenly, someone in the back praised Corando for a quick and excellent job well done. Seeing Saul himself, an obliging smile again shone on the receptionist's face. He walked up to Corando, and behind him stood the very bullies with whom the guy had a conflict after the determination ceremony. Suddenly, Saul asked for that azure eagle to be given to him. Corando remembered that the eagle was a souvenir for Yukishiro, so he objected that he could not give it away. The insolent man asked if he knew who the hunter was, but he said he had no idea. Saul's underlings were angry that Corando dared to be rude to their lord and tried to take the eagle by force, but the leader ordered them to stop. This azure eagle was for his sister's wedding, and so he shouted to his subordinates not to touch the bird with their dirty hands. The administrator explained that the man was the son of a member of the Delagna parliament from a very noble family and a four-star hunter, Sol Demiter Brahim. Now that the interlocutor realized who was speaking to him, the warrior again demanded the bird, promising that he would pay any amount. Saul tossed a few bills under his feet, assuming that would be enough, but Corando clearly repeated that he was not going to give up the eagle. Bregoy assumed the newcomer was just padding his price, since no one with 10 stars could have defeated such a monster. So he was sure that Corando had simply found the corpse in a field somewhere and brought it with him. Saul warned that he could make sure the boy wasn't allowed to hunt, not just in the city, but in the whole country. Corando explained that he didn't care about the country or the hunters themselves. This made the warrior reach for his sword, but then the administrator interrupted the argument and asked him to stop. The man asked what parts of the eagle Saul needed, and he said feathers and beak. The same question was asked to Corando, but he only needed meat and tail feathers. In that case, the administrator offered to sell the parts Saul needed at a reasonable price. Corando did not object, telling the knight that he could get everything he needed from the guild, and the latter in turn promised to turn a blind eye to everything that had happened. The resolution of the conflict caused all onlookers to exhale in relief. Soon Corando was given his meat and feathers, neatly packed in rolls, as well as a thousand kin from Mr. Sola. The young man asked where the former employee was, and in response, he heard that he was trying to catch his breath. A colleague of the former administrator asked if Corando would like to open an account so that he could use his money freely in any city or country. The guy did not object, so his new account was immediately deposited 27,000 kin. Suddenly, Corando noticed an interesting order on the wall, so he told the administrator that he would take care of it. The man drew attention to the four-star rank of the task, but the hunter objected that the paper has been hanging for a year. And according to the rules of the guild, if no one has taken the order for a long time, then anyone can take on its fulfillment. Corando strolled through the market, attracting more and more attention, so it was decided to enter the store sooner rather than later. One of the shops boasted a fairly wide selection of goods, from battle armor to common spices. The young man picked up an axe with a sharpening stone, a few pouches, chili peppers, and salt, all of which cost 2,500 kin. Having taken enough souvenirs, 
Corando went out of the gate and into the mountains, humming a song and not even realizing that he was being followed. One of the spies marveled at such an ugly tune, but the other ordered them to shut up as the target finally made a halt. They decided to finish him off quickly and get out of here. The arrowheads drew the bowstring tightly and then flew swiftly forward, piercing the hunter's chest. The assassins lit up the body and were horrified to find that it was the magic of darkness. They wondered how something like this could be pulled off by a guy with 10 stars, but more importantly, what to tell Mr. Saul. These idiots didn't even realize that they were being watched from above by their two friends who continued on their way home with smiles on their face. Noticing the appearance of the owner of the den, Akari ran happily towards them, inquiring how everything went. Corando admitted that he hadn't seen this many people in a long time and also informed him of the guild registration. He rummaged around in his bag and handed the girl a quill, explaining that it was a souvenir. Judging by the beautiful bluish hue, Akari assumed it was the feather of an azure eagle. He told her what had happened and she was very impressed. Corando wondered if the bird was hard to kill. Akari explained that the eagle is not some rare or special creature, but is usually hunted by those whose rank is at least seven stars. However, to kill one, preserving its beautiful color is a very difficult task. If one were to kill an eagle with magic, it would inevitably lose its color, and if struck at altitude, it would fall down, covered in mud, so one must match the moment before the eagle descends to a low altitude. Corando suggested that he was very lucky, but Akari stated that he had no idea how lucky as a feather with preserved color is an incredibly rare item. It's a popular item among noble ladies and superstitious hunters. Now Corando understood why everyone was staring at him. Suddenly, Yukishiro's tail hit the ground with force, so the young man realized that he had brought a souvenir for him as well. He took out a wreath of eagle feathers and placed it on the leopard's head, which made Akari marvel at how beautiful it was. Yukishiro grudgingly threw the ornament down and grinned but his friend quickly pulled out a roll of meat and handed it to the beast. Corando remembered the girl and wondered how she had been eating all this time. But Akari told him not to worry because Yukashiro had been carrying her food and taking care of her throughout the guy's absence. In that case, Corando assumed that the leopard had taught her how to use the dwelling as well, but he was wrong. He led Akari to the cave and explained that water came from melting snow or could be created with magic. It can also be heated with fire magic. And if you do it long enough, it comes out a real hot spring, which is very relaxing. He led the girl to the next room, showing her the toilet. Corando told her that he'd made it Western style at first, but when Yukashiro started using it, he had to use the Japanese format for his convenience. Next, they walked to the storage room. Among the frozen stock were a horned bear, a great mountain sheep, a thundering duck, and even a horned spider. The girl admitted that she had never even seen some of these beasts before. And in fact, they were all magical creatures that were hunted by people with a rank of at least four stars. Corando wondered if Sor could handle them, but Akari explained that he'd gotten his stars by bonding. In fact, she doubted the jerk was stronger than six stars. Corando explained that his armor looked so clean that it felt like he'd never used it once. Seeing the look of surprise in Akari's face, the boy explained that Saul had prevented him from bringing souvenirs. The girl lowered her head in embarrassment so Corando apologized, suggesting that he shouldn't have reminded the idiot. Finally, he led his guest to a room whose walls were scrawled with strange symbols, explaining that it was a workshop and laboratory. Corando admitted that Yukashiri didn't like the smell of this room. After looking at all the potions and animal skulls, Akari informed her that there were a lot of suspicious things in here that the local authorities could execute for having. But Corando explained that it was all necessary for self-defense. He pointed to the targets at the end of the workshop, explaining that they could practice with bows and other weapons there. Akari wondered if he was using a bow, but Corando demonstrated a boomerang, which he aptly threw, breaking through a wooden head. The girl noticed that these implements were made of a three-toed horn. Corando wondered if it was such a famous animal, for the giant had noticed it too. Akari confirmed that it was, in the past for example, many peoples had used the antlers of the three-toed deer for hunting, Nowadays, however, they are used more as jewelry and hunted by those whose rank is at least six stars. Akari explained that these beasts are possessed in places even colder than here, so they could even be considered rare. Corando pointed out the rather detailed description of the three-toed deer, and the girl explained that she had studied at the academy for six months. 
so she knew the language and other peculiarities of this world. And then she started being tested madly by the hunters. Akari assumed that the interlocutor could also immediately understand the local language, because all the summon received the ability of automatic translation. No one else in this world has such a skill, though it must be analogous to some kind of magic. Suddenly, Yukashiro roared, and Kurando realized it was time for lunch. Soon, the eagle meat and spices that had been brought in were turned into quite tasty dishes that were placed on plates and spread out on the table. Akari admitted that she hadn't realized how delicious the landlord's cooking was. She noticed that he was very original and skillful in his use of spirit magic. Corando explained that he was just practicing a lot. He said that it used to take eight hours of sleep to regain his strength, but now it takes about half as much. However, as the book says, the amount of magical power can increase. Corando also told how for 580 days, he completely depleted his supply, sometimes even several times a day. Constant fatigue in his muscles, headaches, nausea, rapid heartbeat, panting. He admitted that at one time he was terribly tired of it, although this training in magic reminded him of sports training, but Akari shouted that it was not like that at all. She explained that the boy could die at any moment, as the depletion of magic weakens the life force as well. Just one wrong step and it could be the end of everything. Akari stated that such a method could only be used if there was someone around to back her up. However, Kurando remarked that nothing had happened to him. Akari didn't believe it was a coincidence, as over a thousand depletions of his magic power would definitely affect the guy. Kurando was different from all other humans in that magical power did not sustain life in his body. Those born in another world don't need magic power. That's why by depleting magic power over and over again, he was able to increase his supply of it very much. For those born in this world, depleting even 50 of the reserve could be fatal, but Kurando could even use the magic needed to sustain life, so he could deplete 75. He admitted that even with those powers, he was given a very low rank. Akari couldn't believe that the guy had even passed the aptitude assessment already. Kurando started to tell about her results, but the girl objected that it was better not to tell anyone about such things, because then one would learn about a person's weaknesses. She asked not to forget how cruel this world was. However, Akari herself was quick to tell about her excellent combination with light, and, noticing the strange look of her interlocutor, said that she had nothing to hide. As long as he shared it, the girl assumed that Kurando was special compared to the other recognized ones, because all of them were more compatible with light than with darkness although there was one more, Akihara Hayato. The boy immediately recognized the name of the rogue, who snatched his sword from him during the summoning ceremony. Akari explained that he got two abilities at once. The first is Holy Sword, but nothing is known about it. But the second is Spirit Lover, which allows him to see and hear spirits, and some even say that he can touch them. Plus, he has a perfect match with all elements except darkness. He is currently the only person with this kind of power in this world. In that case, Kurando assumed that he could use magic of all elements, but he couldn't figure out why darkness didn't work for him. Akari explained that it was rumored to be the second ability. It seems the Holy Sword doesn't mix with darkness. In any case, Kurando stated that he didn't care about this, Ikiharu guy. Akari questioned whether he really didn't care. She apologized, explaining that she just wanted to understand her new friend's true feelings. Kurando admitted that he was certainly curious about what happened to that guy, but he was able to do things in this world that he couldn't even dream of in Japan. So he just wants to live peacefully and quietly. It is for this reason that the young man doesn't care about this Aishiharu. He is sure that he will definitely get into trouble as soon as he meets this guy. He will never forgive him for this evil deed. And he knows one thing for sure. He will never give in to Aichihara Hayato. Soon all three roommates are out hunting. After a short walk, Kurando bent down and began plucking an unusual grass that was even poking out from under a large patch of snow. Akari couldn't believe it was trauma grass. This spice costs about a thousand kin, the same as an Azure eagle's feather. She admitted that she had never even seen it, but Kurando said that she had not only seen it, but eaten it, for he used it as a seasoning for chowder and curry. Akari couldn't believe she'd eaten such an expensive food, but Kurando explained that it grew everywhere around here. In fact, he wouldn't have guessed it was such a valuable product she hadn't told him. Recording, the girl suggested that it was all about the spiky spiders. Because the Tremor grows so close to their habitat, no one picks the grass here. Akari explained that Kurando 
now had a virtual monopoly on gathering this ingredient. The young man had been constantly unlucky in the past world, but now luck had finally smiled upon him. Akari noticed that he wasn't the only one, as she suddenly pointed out to her friend that it was snowing. However, Kurando objected that it wasn't snowing. Yukashiro also roared loudly, as he saw an ice spirit ahead that had lost its mind. This hostile creature was about to appear from the vortex he himself had created. Finally, a horrible bony monster of bright red color appeared in front of the trio. In fact, monsters are the only thing that prevents Kurando from living peacefully in the mountain. When spirits don't get enough magical power, they begin to starve, and a starving spirit loses its mind and soon turns into a monster. The book says that light magic is especially effective against such creatures. The boy turned to Akari, asking if she could do it. She said she could do it, but it would take time to create the spell. In that case, Kurando announced that he and Yukashiro would buy that necessary time and ordered her to try to do it. But from a safe place, Kurando knew that monsters become the enemy of all living things, so he prepared for battle. The leopard rushed forward and toppled the spirit to the ground and clawed at its face with its powerful fangs. But the monster quickly got to its feet, tossing Yukashiro aside. Kurando used earth magic to delay the enemy and asked Akari about the spell, but she informed him that it wasn't ready yet. Suddenly, the monster's body began to stretch out, coming towards the guy. So Yukashiro pounced on it again, locking his jaws on the spirit's legs, but it launched tentacles that began to cover the leopard's body. He tried to reach Kurando with his hands, but he managed to dodge the first attack, but missed the second. The monster's sword came down with force on the boy's hands and face. The spirit swung for a second strike, but it was struck by an arrow of light from Akari. The rays pierced its body in many places, and then the monster exploded into pieces. The last thing Kurando saw before he passed out was the head of his opponent, which landed right in front of him. He woke up in the cave, wrapped in a blanket and surrounded by his friends. Akari asked him not to move, explaining that his arms and jaw were broken. Kurando mumbled something in response, but the girl assumed it wouldn't be possible to speak for a while longer. Akari apologized, explaining that she could only administer first aid while Kurando was unconscious, but now that he was awake, she could continue the treat. She chained the boy to the bed to keep him still and warned him that it would still be impossible to grit his teeth without a jaw muscle. Akari admitted that the young man was very lucky since she had been taught the magic by Maxim himself and suggested that she start. If the patient was okay with it, of course. Since accelerated healing magic is usually accompanied by unbearable pain, it requires a person's consent to use it. Akari took hold of her jaw and soon the bones that had been shattered by the blow were fused back together. Next came the right arm, and then finally the left arm was almost back to its original state, and the screams from the cave could be heard as far away as the habitat of the spiky spiders. Akari announced that the procedures were complete, but warned that she might get a fever during the night, so she asked to be patient for a while. Kurando mumbled something again, and then barely managed to ask if he could speak now, having been granted permission. He inquired about what happened next. Akari told him that thanks to him and Yukashiro, the monster had weakened, and then he had finished it off, and now he was 100% sure that the crazy spirit was dead. Kurando admitted that he didn't even realize that the girl knew how to use holy magic. Holy magic was the only type of spell created to destroy monsters. Its creators were followers of the Church of Sandra, but they are better known by the nickname of the Servants of the Moon God. Holy magic had been a secret for a long time, used only by the monks of the cult. But as the world became more and more crowded and monster attacks became more frequent, the monks had to reveal the secret, and holy magic was used all over the world. Kurando mumbled about causing a lot of trouble for his friend, but Akari countered that it was rather the opposite. However, she revealed, the one who really cared about the guy was Yukashiro. The bard walked over to the bed and began to lick his injured friend affectionately. Suddenly, Yukashiro turned around and then brought the monster shield in his teeth. Akari explained that after the spirit died, it had left behind some of its equipment, the shield and the stick that it used to shatter the young man's bones. The girl said that such things happened, though it was the first time she had ever seen such a thing with her own eyes. Yukashiro put the shield on the bed and lay down tiredly, watching the leopard's behavior. Akari seemed to blame himself for not being able to protect his friend, though perhaps it was just the peculiarities of this old giant's life magic. Kurando tried to get out of bed but couldn't hold on and nearly fell down, but was caught by Yukishiro. 
he announced that he was going to visit the bath and invited the beast to join him. Thus, tumbling from one side to the other, they reached their destination. The boy tried to summon water, but it didn't work. It seems that the magic power hadn't had time to recover yet, so he asked his feigned friend to do so. Finally, the bathtub filled with hot water, and Kurando happily immersed himself in it. Seeing the lad's pleasure, Yukashiro scattered and jumped into the water, raising a mighty splash. They sprawled out in opposite corners and began to enjoy their rest. Kurando began to reflect on everything that had happened. This was the first time he had ever killed something that looked like a human. In fact, he had never really enjoyed killing, even when hunting. That feeling of a blade slicing through living flesh, he could never get used to it. That time, in the encounter with Saul's gang, if things had turned out differently, he would have had to kill them. Although Kurando really didn't want that day to ever come, if he did have to do it, his hand would not waver. With those thoughts, he walked out of the bathtub right as Akari walked in there. She plopped down on the ground, explaining that she got worried when she didn't find the young man in bed, which was why she went looking for him. Akari couldn't understand why he was taking a bath with the lights off and even naked, which surprised Kurando a lot. It wasn't naked, but the girl ordered him to be quiet. She said that it was too early for him to get up, let alone use magic power. Akari was sure that it was impossible to recover so quickly from such wounds. But suddenly she thought about it and came to the conclusion that Kurando had cured himself with his magic. So now he was walking on the edge of exhaustion. The next morning, Kurando found his friend at the entrance to the cave with her face covered with her hands. He apologized for interrupting his musings but warned that he was coming down from the mountains. So he asked her to be careful. Akari shouted that he shouldn't do that, since just yesterday he could barely stand on his feet, and today he was going to climb rocks. Kurando explained that due to the appearance of the monsters, a reconnaissance was necessary. He explained that they were doing badly when it came to a whole wave of deranged spirits. Of course, monsters don't appear by themselves, but when one appears, its madness can spread to its kin. When there are too many of them, they start attacking human settlements. That's why Kurando was on a scouting trip. He was about to leave, but Akari grabbed his sack. The girl explained that since she couldn't stop him, she asked him to at least listen to his request. Before he comes down from the mountain, Akari has asked to be trained in holy magic. She simply can't let her friend go if he can't kill the monster. The girl admitted that, in fact, no one would let go. You just need to believe and wish. Faith will generate a holy spirit which will destroy the monster. Although Kurando himself does not fully understand the difference between an ordinary spirit and a holy spirit. Nevertheless, that should hardly be a hindrance. Akari explained that holy magic has been used for over 500 years and promised to teach the boy how to use it. They sat down by the fire and Kurando tried to create a spell. And the girl said that the sensations should be something similar to the magic of lightning. Three days passed in this way and Kurando decided it was time to set off. He handed his friend a book of spells so that she would have something to do at her leisure, and she in turn insistently asked to buy strong armor, because if they were, then perhaps, and would not have to resort to healing magic. Finally, Kurando reached the guild, but the administrator with a cold look objected that this order, taken by the guy last time, is invalid, so it is impossible to pay the reward. Kurando interrogated what invalid meant. The man explained that some time before the order was taken, the Dalgan Parliament had proposed changes to the rules for accepting stale tasks. Now they could only be accepted with a rank no more than two stars below the required rank. The administrator was very surprised that his assistant hadn't reported it, but promised that no fine would be levied this time. In that case, he inquired what the hunter would do with the Tramer grass, but Kurando countered that he would eat it himself. The guy admitted that he had a conversation to have. The administrator warned that protests against the rules of Parliament were not accepted, but Kurando explained that the talk was about monsters. The man asked to wait for a while and excused himself to contact the head of the branch. At that moment, a group of bullies reappeared from behind, led by this tattooed bully, who didn't miss the opportunity to mock the missed reward. He wondered who Kurando thought he was, if he was allowed to get involved in orders that weren't of his level. His companions demanded a demonstration of the herb, if it was real, but Kurando repeated that he would rather eat it himself. The bullies argued that Tramer cost a lot of money in the capital, so only aristocrats could eat it. Finally, the receptionist appeared and invited the young man inside. Kurando was about to pass as the big guy suddenly grabbed him by the neck, ordering him to show him the herb. 
Suddenly, the fellow grabbed his hands with such force that the big man howled in pain, and looking at his wrists, he saw finger marks. Nevertheless, he informed his companions that he felt no magic. He had shook wise in motion happened, like he assumed he had reacted automatically due to the fact that he often fought Yukishiro. The administrator knocked on the door and then opened it, ushering the boy into the room of the branch head. The man was surprised, as this newcomer had already caused the guild a lot of trouble, and now he was also claiming the appearance of monsters. He assumed that Karando was just being arrogant, because he had been recommended by the captain of the White Spear, but warned that the exception could apply to anyone. The head introduced himself as Yakov Sergei Meisel, and asked if the young man thought he was trying to put too much on his shoulders. The man admitted that he had already heard about that incident with the Azure Eagle, but finally asked what Karando wanted to talk about. Yakov simply couldn't believe that a rookie with 10 stars could defeat a maddened ice spirit, and even alone. Meanwhile, a girl appeared on the threshold of the office and watched the dialogue with interest. Karando showed the shield as proof, but the head of the room said that they were lying around every corner. He remarked that if he was going to lie, he should lie wisely, suggesting that the newcomer was just trying to raise his rank. He called the young man a fool, for you could only get an extra star through hard work. Yakov was surprised at his own eloquence, but said that Corando was lucky, because there were few hunters now, so everyone was important. However, the man also revealed that he would have a handler assigned to him from now on. He explained that he lost a lot of good guys on that mountain, and all because of that stupid hero who was just obsessed with honor. But the curator wouldn't let that happen, not to accept a request that would be out of his league. Corando did not understand what was going on, because he spit on hunters in this guild as suddenly the same girl entered the room, which surprisingly turned out to be quite tall. She introduced herself as a four-star hunter Aleda Baggin and announced that she was working in the guild from today. The head jumped up from his seat, delighted by the girl's appearance, and welcomed her into his branch. However, his smile quickly faded when Aleda announced that she was taking this guy for herself. Yakov argued that she hadn't even reached three stars yet, so she couldn't have such a hunter wasting her talent on a novice. The girl wondered if she couldn't point this young man in the right direction, and then cut off that it was settled and asked Corando to follow her. He did not know whether he should do so, but curiosity took over, and so he decided to go. The girl walked to the bar and then gulped down an entire mug of the drink, raising applause from those present. She then handed the drink to Corando, and he did the same, also eliciting cheers from the other patrons of the establishment. The boy said he wouldn't drink again, as he didn't like such bitter alcohol and Aleda explained that alcohol could make life sweeter or make it bitter. She asked if Cornado knew that sweet alcohol was usually drunk by lovers, and he admitted that he had heard something like that. Nevertheless, the Huntress stated that this mug had to be drunk, as it was an old initiation rite for newcomers. The girl repeated her name and status again, noting that she was also a giant. She explained that she couldn't stand all the formalities at work, so she asked to be called Aleda. She asked if there were any more questions and reintroduced herself to the whole mug. Corando admitted that he had a lot of questions, and the first was why she wanted to be his handler. Ileda explained that for a guy like him, with or without a handler, there was no difference. So upon reflection, she concluded that she could expect a lot of problems from Corando. Ileda explained that she would not interfere in his hunt, but she could help with advice, so she could be considered a protective shield but said that she was still responsible for the newcomer's actions. That was how handlers worked. Suddenly, a small, fat silhouette appeared on the guild's doorstep and screamed for help, but was suddenly thrown outside. One of the hunters assumed it was an orc, but the others disagreed, for the creature looked more like a boar. A short, fat man in a uniform rose to his feet, and shaking himself off, said that he had heard of a man who had fulfilled an order to collect tramer grass, and that was why he had come here. The administrator was very surprised at the appearance of the noble baron, and quickly opened the doors, ushering the guest inside. The hunters recognized this wayward aristocrat, who was eating like himself. According to rumors, he was ready to kill for Tramer. The administrator explained that the order had been taken by mistake by a newcomer, and said he was sorry. Suddenly, the baron dropped down and, inhaling with his huge nose, wondered why then the place smelled of this herb. Seeing this scene, the hunters were definitely convinced that the man looked rather like a pig. He followed the trail and soon suggested with hope in his eyes that Corando had a tramer. The Baron stated that he didn't care about the nuances of the guild and asked very much that the herb be given to him. He admitted that he had waited a year for this day, so the young man said he would get it now 
seeing off the disgruntled administrator with a smile. The man couldn't wait to taste the herb, and his huge mouth filled with drool. But Corando asked him to calm down, promising that he would get some. Finally, he held out a few bundles, and the Baron popped one into his mouth with gusto, savoring it greedily. Tears welled up in his eyes as he confessed that when he was young, his grandfather had given him his first taste of Tramer, so it was a true taste of childhood. He even tried to hug his benefactor, but Corando inquired about payment. The Baron's eyes rounded sharply and sweat broke out on his face. He awkwardly tried to explain that he had recently paid for groceries and asked to understand that he had nothing but words of thanks right now, which made the giantess chuckle. Corando interrogated if there was nothing at all. After all, this was an aristocrat, and the man admitted that there was not a penny left even though he was the head of the barony. In that case, the young man whispered something in the ear of his interlocutor and waited to see if the latter would get angry. The Baron understood what he meant, but it was a family heirloom, so he did not consider the exchange to be of equal value. But Corando again showed the bundles of the much-coveted seasoning. The man immediately changed his face admitting that the newcomer's eagerness had won him over. Nevertheless, he made a small amendment to the contract, asking the boy to carry all the goodies for him, if he could find any, of course. Corando stated that he agreed, unless of course the guild objected. The Baron rejoiced and ordered the administrator to carry a table, paper, and pen. The man reminded him that this was a family heirloom after all, so he asked for more herbs, and Corando pulled out a few more bundles. Finally, the contract was signed, and the Baron explained that his home was not far from here. He said goodbye to everyone and headed importantly towards the exit. Aleda told them that this weirdo had only recently received his new title, and he was already acting like a big shot, but from the back, he still looked like an orc. Nevertheless, he was a representative of an old aristocratic house, so she was surprised at how easy the negotiations had been. Corando tried to stand up, but lost his balance and bumped his face right into the curator's decolletage. He apologized, explaining that he had completely forgotten that he was drunk. Elida admitted that she wanted to look at the guy when he blushed, but there was no reaction. Finally, she asked what he'd bargained for. Corando reported that this fat man's baronies held the secrets of autonomous magic. Autonomous magic had been discovered before the advent of spiritual magic. The latter follows the laws of this world, while autonomous magic can ignore some of them. For this reason, its use requires catalysts, and the spells themselves are read. Now autonomous magic is hardly ever used, as these catalysts cost a lot of money and take a lot of time to learn. Before the advent of spiritual magic, autonomous magic also supported the authority of the aristocrat and also strengthened royal power. At the moment, it is used by such representatives of the barony as this weirdo, although they hide the very fact of the existence of autonomous magic. Elena laughed, did Corando bargain for something that probably didn't even exist, but he noted that there was no guarantee he'd be bringing the Baron anything tasty either. The guy explained that it was very difficult to get the original text of autonomous magic on his own, so it was worth it. However, the girl suggested another option. The Baron just goes home and laughs loudly. Corando admitted that he estimates the Baron's mental abilities somewhat lower. However, even if it is a deception, he will not be upset because he is already used to such things. But now, for the first time, he feels that he made a good deal. Elada inquired if the ward would be taking an order tonight, but he countered that he was already drunk. In that case, she wondered how Corando was going to move up in the rankings, but he claimed that she was the one who'd gotten him drunk. Elada drank the mug in a volley again, noting that the newcomer looked too strange for a hunter. No armor or equipment. The young man admitted that he wanted to make the armor in town, but the giantess asked to be shown the material first. Corando placed the bag on the table and was about to pull out the contents when suddenly Elada cupped her hands around the bag, stopping the lad and asked where he got that spiky spider skin, but Corando objected that he couldn't say that. In that case, she called for speculage. A newcomer with 10 stars brings with him the skin of a huge creature that dwells in the mountains. She explained that only one thing came to mind. It was stolen. The boy wondered how he hadn't guessed it himself. Nevertheless, Elada offered to give the item to her, promising to make suitable armor in the big city. Corando wondered if he could trust such valuable material to someone he had recently met. He said he had nowhere to hurry. The giantess did not object, but still advised him to acquire at least some armor. Corando got up from his seat, but again he stumbled back and buried his face in the neckline of the curator, who even thought he was doing it on purpose. The next morning, Corando met with the giantess already in his new armor, and they decided to go to the guild, much to her surprise. 
Out of the orders for 10 stars, there was only the gathering of herd balls. This struck Eleda as odd, as the guild should post tasks for newcomers, even if there were no requests from locals, to help younger comrades raise their rankings. She decided to ask what was the matter, but suddenly Sol called out to her, interjecting to ask if beasting Eleda Boggan had actually stopped by here. The huntress stated that she didn't like being called that. Saul introduced himself, identifying himself as the captain of the werewolf clan. He admitted that he had heard that the giantess was nearing her three stars and reminded her that the fastest way to ascend was to fulfill a difficult order. He inquired if Aleda wanted to hunt a huge spiky spider. The girl reminded him that it was a three-star order, but Saul explained that it had been hanging for a while. Besides, you could get around some of the rules if you wanted to. Now Corando was finally convinced that the jerk had power here. However, Eleda had chosen to refrain from such a tempting offer, much to Brago's surprise. He wondered why she should bother with this outsider, since it was a waste of time. But she reminded Saul that he had a handler at the beginning, but he argued that he was not an outsider either. He didn't understand who cared about a weirdo who came from somewhere in the mountains, because everyone has their own life, so there's no point in creating potential competitors. The guild also prioritizes local hunters because they would never run away. Elida reminded him that she too was an outsider, but Saul countered that she was special. The clan captain explained that there was a big difference between four-star and three-star hunters. The former couldn't even touch the monsters that three-star hunters killed. Saul admitted that he had heard of Elida, nicknamed Beasting, in other towns as well. In every settlement where she stayed, she always became the leader of some band of hunters. And on the mission itself, she was the first to rush into battle, and was rumored to have even killed ogre birds with her spear, which was why she was so nicknamed. Saul declared that they would be violating Dolgan's name if they didn't go on a couple hunts. However, Elida countered that by not fulfilling their duties as handlers, they were denying the newcomers a chance. The girl apologized to the ancestral hunters, but informed them that Saul would have to forget about Dolgan's honor and look for someone else. Upon hearing the refusal, the cocky young man became angry and shouted that he didn't care about the fat giantess and the smelly migrant, then turned around and headed for the exit with his entire entourage. Elida explained to her ward that some people just can't take rejection from a woman. Giants are very respectful of their ancestors, and since she mentioned them, the conversation was over. The girl was sure Soul wouldn't leave it at that, even though it was the first time she had met him. Isolate Man had broken into the branch manager's office and, despite the meeting, had overturned his chair in anger. He plopped down on the couch and threw his legs over the table, saying that he was fed up with the mountain goat. First the recommendation from the giant, then the eagle, and now the bee's lackey. Jacob assumed that this was the reason for his bad mood, so he offered to give this guy the order. The administrator realized that Elida had arrived here recently, so she might not know some of the nuances, and explained that now there were only her balls among the tasks for newcomers. In that case, the curator asked how newcomers to this city could raise their rankings. The man said that they could join a group, but if they couldn't, he advised them not to get involved, as the guild didn't need hunters who couldn't work as a team. In that case, Elida said that she was forming a group herself and ordered to enroll the boy as a member, which confused the administrator a bit, but he didn't object. Suddenly, the head of the branch appeared behind their backs and announced that he forbade the formation of the squad as the union of a veteran and a newcomer was not very beneficial for the society. Yakov showed a piece of paper, explaining that the guild had prepared an order especially for Corando. It was designed for eight nine stars, so that everything would be according to the rules and promised to consider an official application for his participation in the group, but warned that in case of failure, he would have to cancel the preliminary registration of the newcomer. After reading the text, the guys couldn't believe their eyes but Yakov asked to consider it a forced order. When there is an emergency situation in the region such as an outbreak of magical beasts or monster attacks, the guild has the right to forcibly recruit hunters to the team, almost reaching the location. Aleda asked her ward what he was gonna do now. Corando said that he would try to fulfill the order, but if it didn't work out, he would just run away to the mountains because he didn't care about the guild anyway. But the giantess couldn't understand why the guy was so calm. After all, it was a completely unreasonable demand, but he admitted that he had often experienced something similar until he found himself in the mountains. But the mountain of muscle that had run away and still hadn't returned had taught him patience. Elida recognized that this guy was pretty weird, 
but agreed that it was impossible to lose one's head, even though it was the first time she'd found herself in such a horrible branch. Nevertheless, Corando remarked that everything was by the book, but the giantess still couldn't contain her anger. Two hours ago, she'd queried what these magical beasts out of control were, and Jacob had explained that the Miss Starlings, gathering in flocks on the outskirts of the city, attacked those walking near the water, which was exactly what out of control meant. Noting a few more questionable clauses in the contract, Elida assumed that the head was just going to use his position to kick the newcomer out. But he countered that everything was in accordance with the rules. Kernado then asked for more details about the birds, as he couldn't figure out what harm they were doing. The administrator explained that Miss Darlings live in large flocks in the treetops, so people suffer from constant noise and food deposits. The man even showed a photo of these birds. Corando had to bend down to look at such a small thing, but Yaakov warned that it was necessary to get rid of all the birds, otherwise there would be no point. The thing is that Miss Starlings breed very quickly, so even if you leave only a couple of individuals, soon there will be a whole flock that will settle back in the tree. The head remarked that the townspeople had themselves to blame for not paying to control their population. Elida warned the boy that she could go with him and help as a handler, but admitted that even she would have a hard time catching all the birds alone. It would take a whole group of hunters. She suggested that someone might want to join them, but Corando just asked the guild to provide a net or something. The head of the branch laughed and promised to provide as many nets as needed, but warned that if the assignment failed, there would be an end to every. There would be no more room for the guy in this town, but Corando said he was taking the order. The administrator then held out a copy of the order form, but Corando remarked that there was no difference between a regular and a forced order, which surprised Jacob. He asked again if it really mattered that much. Elida inquired Corando had a family, for there must be one, despite the fact that he lived in the mountains. The young man admitted that there was one, or rather one, flea bag. He asked Elida to bring other hunters here if he couldn't handle it himself. Kirindo assumed that this was what the branch was trying to accomplish, an increase in experienced warriors. The girl asked if he didn't want to be a hunter himself, but Kirindo said that so far it had been nothing but trouble. He admitted that he was only still doing it because he had certain reasons, but he wouldn't lose anything if he had to leave. Although he was sorry that Maxim's recommendation would be lost and the curator's efforts would also go down the drain, Suddenly, the girl asked about Maxim's recommendation, and the young man confirmed that he was talking about the captain of the White Spear. In that case, the giantess promised that she would keep an eye on the lad until the very end. Corando wondered if they knew each other, and Elida confessed that she had made some mistakes in her youth. Suddenly, she grabbed him by the collar, wondering if he wanted to say something, but her gaze fell on a tree whose crown was obscured by a multitude of birds perched on it. Elida explained that it was a fancy goddess tree whose ripe berries were good for hangovers. It was usually looked after when they went on expeditions, but it was in a terrible state now. She asked if Corando was still confident that he could handle such an impossible task. The young man informed her that he would stay here for the time being and inquired what the giantess was going to do. Elida explained that the curator could not leave a newcomer in trouble and therefore would not run away. She moved closer to the tree, but Corando warned that the starlings wouldn't start breeding until they sensed danger. They sat down near the tree and waited. On the second day, Elida returned with several vessels behind her back. The hunters took out some bread and continued to wait. Behind their backs, the locals appeared. They watched the two with interest, trying to figure out why the hunters were just sitting there. One of the men even thought about joining the guild, because it would be a dream job, just sitting in one place, eating and drinking. On the third day, the giantess began to think his ward had a plan, and the crowd of onlookers grew even larger. On the fourth day, Corando finally stood up, which made the locals gain hope that he had a plan to get rid of those pesky starlings. Corando moved closer and then shouted and waved his arms, chasing the birds further away from the tree. The townspeople began to disperse with their heads down, for it was useless. Some even suggested burning the tree, so that the birds would find another. But others were against it, for it was one of a kind. Corando used light magic to examine the trunk and asked the curator to go to the nearest store to get a pin and a leaf. He reported that he seemed to have found a solution. The young man demonstrated the drawing, explaining that he would do it this way. But Elida was only interested in her drawing skills. She even assumed that the guild didn't like him because he didn't look like a normal hunter. 
The girl was again convinced how interesting he was, but Corando asked her to stay focused and share her opinion on the plan. The giantess agreed that the plan was pretty interesting too. Suddenly, a bright flash of light and a loud sound deafened the branch head's office. Looking out the window, he realized that the source of the anomaly was off to the side where Corando was on a mission, and so he decided to head there immediately. The guy's idea was to disorient the starlings with light magic, and then, using the wind, quickly cast a net, which should have been frozen to prevent the birds from escaping the trap. Next, the giantess was to step in. Elayda liked the plan, but using several spirits at once was risky business. She wondered if he could handle it without exhausting himself. The boy explained that he would create a puddle below and freeze it as well, so that the starlings that would fall would shatter on the hard ice. Corando asked the curator for only one thanks, to finish off the birds that would remain alive after the fall. The girl reminded him that magic of the second and third classes was forbidden in the city, so it was easier to freeze them all, since the first class included only non-lethal spells. Elayda suggested that she should deal with the birds manually. Watching her ward's actions, she couldn't believe that he was able to use several spirits at once, and even with such precision. Finally, Corando tightened the net and all the starlings were confined. That's a huge amount of magical power for this world. So Elida couldn't even imagine what the guy had to go through to acquire such power. He concluded that it had worked and then struck the trunk to make the net with the birds fall down. The locals began to cheer, but Jacob declared that this method of hunting was illegal. So he revoked Corando's right to continue the task, promising that further action would be handled by the guild. This caused unhappy shouts as the next thing left was the simplest, and someone even called the guild leadership crooks. But the head ordered to shut up, reminding that the townspeople themselves are to blame for the fact that starlings breed so much. The man with a satisfied look explained that the newcomer, who hadn't even familiarized himself with the rules, had used forbidden second-class magic. When asked by the curator for proof, the head stated that he had heard a sound uncharacteristic of first-class spells, and therefore cut off that it was not up for discussion. Seeing the disgruntled faces of the crowd, Jacob simply turned around and walked away. Elayda warned that the young man had better not relax now, even though the branch head had now backed off. Nevertheless, the main question remained. What to do with all those starlings? Because the two of them would definitely not be able to cope. Corando offered to freeze them before they woke up and think about it later, but the civilians promised to help if it was necessary to kill these birds. Thus, the net was soon empty and several dozen bags of Miss Starling corpses stood near the tree. Elayda ordered her ward to get up, because they still had a victory to celebrate, but he explained that he was on the verge of exhaustion. Nevertheless, the girl assumed that he would still drink delicious alcohol with her, and did not miss. By the way, she admitted that she was still surprised by the young man's agility and reserve of magical power, so she asked him if he had ten stars for sure. She explained that hunters had only tried to kill starlings before, but Corando was definitely different. He said that he had just noticed the effects of bright lights and loud lights on the birds, and then the idea somehow came to him on its own. The giantess looked at his ward with interest and said that he no longer needed a handler. She didn't understand why his face had changed so dramatically, but she could see that Corando looked like a wolf cub that had broken away from the pack. She was sure that he would be able to hunt on his own now, since he was well-trained and had some good equipment, and even more so, he was skilled in spiritual magic. She also said that he was worthy of more than 10 stars. You could say that Corando had grown into a real man, even though he was already 26. He remarked that the words about a real man sounded kind of weird coming out of her mouth, but the girl countered that it was coming from someone who constantly stares at her breasts. By the way, she explained that she did not just wear such frank outfits, but for the reason that the giants warm up a lot due to physical exertion. Several townspeople approached the couple to express their gratitude for solving the problem, and then handed the heroes several bottles of alcohol from tree fruits. They advised them to drink it to relieve fatigue. Elayda offered to drink it right away, and soon the hunters were already sitting in the tavern. The girl couldn't understand what Corando was doing with the drink. He added the local liquor to it, then cooled it with an ice spirit, and lastly threw in a few unripe Iganadia fruits. The giantess warned him that it might be too sweet. Soon a marvelous drink was produced, poured neatly into dainty glasses. Elayda repeated that the boy was quite skilled with magic, but he asked to drink in silence. The girl admitted that she hadn't expected to see cocktails here, 
since the locals only drank hard alcohol, which wasn't surprising considering how long the winners were here. Corando admitted that he finds it easier to drink diluted alcohol, although his mix still came out stronger than expected. In fact, the fruit of the divine tree is used as medicine as well. In any case, she reminded him that today was her last day as curator, so she ordered the young man to drink the rest of it. Soon Elida drew her friend's attention to the fact that the cocktail was over, but he could no longer hold his head and fell on the table with a clatter. The girl was not confused and decided to mix a local drink with strong alcohol, impressing those around her with her stamina. Suddenly, Corando rose from his seat, looked at the giantess, and then grabbed her hand, whispering a suggestion for privacy at the inn. The next day, he woke up and immediately felt the urge to vomit, so he ran to the restroom, scaring even the birds outside with his sounds. Corando decided that he should strengthen his liver, but suddenly he noticed that his magic power was gone, and then he found that he was not in his room. Elida wondered what was wrong, if she was hungover. Corando wondered why she was like that, but the girl rose from her seat, suggesting that he guess for himself, but the young man admitted that he couldn't remember anything. Corando stated that he didn't know and promptly broke into the restroom again. Elida stated that he didn't see her as a woman at all, but her friend countered that she didn't see him as a man either. Nevertheless, she asked not to worry, explaining that she wasn't desperate enough to fall in love with a guy she'd spent a drunken night with. Eventually, Corando officially became a hunter of the 10th rank in the guild and traveled back to the mountains, taking a request to gather Tramer herbs along the way. He also continued to train Ikari in magic, and his practice fights with Yukishiro made him stronger. Elida taught her ward how to handle spears and daggers, and the Baron occasionally received the desired sweets. Thus, three months passed. The saleswoman asked for documentation, wondering why the lad needed so much paper. Corando explained that he just liked to draw, and passing hunters from the werewolf clan advised him to draw a picture of a filthy vagrant climbing into their town. However, others in the crowd asked Corando to ignore these idiots, explaining that Sol and his gang scavenged for small orders. So it annoyed them that a so-called vagrant could get through a web of spiky spiders Corando approached the giantess, wondering why she had called him here. Did he need help in the Allergian Mountains? But the girl explained that was not the case. She reminded him that she needed to travel from country to country, so now she was leaving soon. She offered to do a few last tasks and invited him to the order board. Elida's attention was drawn to the task with the big-headed buffalo, wondering if they were already in season. Corando explained that they were migratory animals, and at this time of year, they came to feed in the city neighborhoods and gave birth to cubs that fed on grass balls. So there was no need to control the number of plants manually. Elida offered to take the task, but a girl in the crowd said that if the bison started defending themselves as a whole herd, the strength of two hunters wouldn't be enough. Since they had decided to take the task, she asked permission to join them. Elida agreed but noted that it would be a good idea to introduce herself first. The girl apologized, explaining that she was simply too enamored of the giantess and called herself Erika Kiritani, a six-star hunter. Elida introduced herself in return, but objected that not even three hunters would be strong enough for such a task, and Erika explained that she was not going to join the task herself, but with her entire Wings of Night clan, led by a one-star hunter, the giantess liked what she heard but remarked that she must have heard this hunter's name at least once, if that was the case. Erica explained that this man had reached the highest rank in only a year, and his name was Hayato Ichihari. Nevertheless, Elida noticed that she had a 10-star rookie on the team with her, and so she asked again if they were still willing to cooperate. The new acquaintance wondered why the four-star hunter had agreed to accept a newcomer to the team, but Corando remembered an urgent matter. So he said he couldn't participate in the assignment. Erica warned that a beauty like her should be careful with guys like that. Suddenly, her captain appeared on the doorstep, and she was incredibly happy to see him, noting, however, that Hayato-san was late. He asked her not to speak so loudly and asked if she had decided on the assignment. Erica said that she had decided to take the bison order and warned that Aleda would be working with them. Hayato admitted that he was honored to meet such a huntress, and the giantess reciprocated. She assumed that Corando had refused to participate precisely because of this captain, though she didn't understand why, since he was quite young. 
She felt a strong light, an incredible courage, and an aura that was very similar to the one her ward exuded. She had planned to leave this country as soon as she had finished one thing, but now she decided to linger, assuming it was necessary now. On the way to the dwelling, Corando hoped the two men wouldn't remember the school janitor. He had been in a past life. Finally, he reached the place where his housemates were resting. Akari noticed that the young man had returned earlier than he had planned, but he blithely told of Ichihara's appearance in town. He handed Yukashiro, who was already rubbing at his feet, a parcel apologizing for his long absence. He shared that the rascal's rank was one star, and also mentioned his authority in the community. Akari couldn't believe he'd gotten all that so quickly, but said that the guy should have been told something else during check-in after all. But Corando countered that Maxim hadn't mentioned any of that. The girl explained that there was a special standing system among hunters that was given for destroying extremely dangerous monsters. These include monsters that bring catastrophic destruction to human life. For example, if you defeat a dragon that attacked a city, your rank would immediately increase. Corando admitted that he didn't know dragons existed in this world, but Akari confirmed that they do, though they hardly ever appear to humans. Once in a while, one might accidentally see one flying by. To humans, the appearance of a dragon on the horizon means death. For many years, they have fought these dangerous creatures, taking a huge toll on the population. Akari suggested that the only reason why Ichihari had received one star so quickly was because he had defeated the dragon that had attacked the city. She admitted that she had even heard some rumors to that effect. Right now, the villain looked like a hero in the eyes of this world. So the girl called to think about what would happen if the person he took the power from showed up. He'd probably want to avoid spreading rumors. Yukishiro started rolling on the ground again, so Karando threw him another piece of meat. He confessed to Akari that he didn't want such a sad outcome as his own murder at all. But anything was possible in this world. He assumed Ichihara was confident that there would be no evidence of his crimes in this world, and who would believe a stranger from the mountains? Corando shouldered his bag and went into the cave, regretfully concluding that the truth would remain in that cave between the three mountain men. Akari awkwardly shared her thoughts that Aichihara had come to this city because of her, either to save her or to kill her. She speculated that Maxim might have blabbed and the rumors had spread further, which was why Hayato had sprung into action. Akari explained that this guy is very arrogant and independent. He does what he wants and always relies only on his own strength. However, there are many in this world who are grateful to him, and some are even under Aishihara's protection. Corando stated that she would be able to use her powers to protect herself anyway, hiding in the mountains, but Akari countered that it wouldn't work. Her magic is useless against the summoned. She explained that if she used the gift of spirits on others like them, the power would not work against them. In other words, the gift of spirits would not work on other heroes. Corando then asked how the Scythe of Truth worked, and Akari explained that there were exceptions. When one hero accepted the gift of another, it worked. So those wounded during battles could accept a hero's gift in order to heal. If they didn't accept the gift, the Scythe would work like an ordinary blade. In that case, the man asked about himself, since he had no gift, but the girl said that she could not know for sure since she had never fought Karando. Suddenly, he pushed her with such force that Akari fell to the ground. Her limbs began to be covered in earthy fetters, and the guy pounced, pinning her down even tighter, interjecting what was happening now. Akari couldn't understand what it all meant and started begging to stop doing that, but Karando repeated the question, marked red now. Suddenly, the girl lashed out and forcefully punched her offender in the face, yelling that he should have chosen another way to find out. However, the guy noticed that she would hardly have taken it. Seriously, if he had just started threatening with a knife, Akari apologized, suggesting that it was her fault too, as she had failed to convey the correctness of things, but reported that Corando had not turned red. Five days later, the lodge master was going hunting and left the girl in charge. She asked if he was going to town, but Corando explained that he did not want it to be killed, so he would stay in the mountains for the time being. He promised to return in two days. He noticed that since that day Akari had been trying to keep her distance, though perhaps it was natural. The girl gazed into the distance and suddenly shouted for Maxim's return. Corando didn't understand how she knew that, and the girl pointed to the rock ahead, wondering how it was possible not to see the whole giant. The boy was showing him the way, of course, but decided to meet his comrade, just in case. Suddenly, a whole crowd of people appeared from behind the hill, following Maxim. 
Kurendo wondered if the man was a bastard who couldn't even keep his promises. Yukashiro immediately bared his fangs, and Kurando reached for his boomerang. But the Velika asked to listen first and explain that he had brought these people here for Akari's sake. But the young man suggested that he probably had other ways to help the girl. One of the cloaked men noticed that the boy was so wary, despite his rather young age. He removed his hood, exposing his face with its pointed ears, and then the rest of the giant's companions followed her example. The woman referred to herself as Orphea, the leader of the followers of the moon goddess, which even made Akari tear up. The woman explained that Maxim had brought them here at her request, and promised that the followers would not intrude on the familiar, though Kurando noted that they had already done so. Orphea revealed that Akari would soon be taking the scythe of truth, and they would accompany her. However, she admitted that she had expected to see the mountain dwellers in a slightly different light, for there were legends about them, and a noble spirit dwelt within both of them. Kurando asked the giant what he had blabbed, but Orphea asked not to blame him, promising that she would take responsibility for everything. She confessed that she was very glad of the fact that she had lived to her years to meet someone like him. The young man regretfully concluded that there was no easy way out now, and Maxim again asked to listen, explaining that the followers would now need to camp here. Orphea asked for a moment of her attention and Kurando was about to approach, but she objected that she meant Yukashiro. The bard gently stepped forward, but then even gave permission to touch herself, much to the guy's surprise. Orphea assumed there was no problem now. Maxim explained that from now on, Everyone here was in quite a predicament because this time the hearing would be held in Salhad. Akari couldn't believe her ears. It turned out that AOI would be there as well, but the woman warned that they needed more time to move around. She explained that the ground of Salhad had been probed beforehand, so they had concluded that the city was preparing for something and, from her guess, it would be something unpleasant. The giant confirmed that it was for that reason that they needed to find a safe place for waiting for the case to be resolved in Salhad was true suicide. Akari could not hold back her tears and clung to Orphea's chest, while the rest of the followers proceeded to set up camp. Watching everything that was going on and realizing what had already happened, Kurando couldn't understand why he was always getting into such situations. By the way, he noticed that among the uninvited guests quite a lot of creatures that are different from the usual human. Orphea suggested that the guy was not quite used to seeing such creatures and he admitted that he had never been to Salehad. The woman explained that most of the people who lived there were human, and the other species lived separately. Discrimination, Kurando agreed that it was everywhere. He asked the followers if they were all hunters, and a large woman confirmed that everyone had different stars. Orphea explained that they are all united in their desire to be under the protection of the goddess, which is why they decided to become followers. They continue their wanderings by hunting, According to the leader, the goddess is pure and doesn't like the opposite sex, so men are forbidden in their midst, but Kurando called them just a bunch of women with excuses. Akari screamed that this was very rude and stated that the guy just doesn't understand anything. She grabbed his arm and dragged him behind her into the cave, promising that she would explain everything now. Kurando was perplexed by what he had said, but once inside, the girl stopped and, apologizing, covered her face with her hands. The young man admitted that he could understand Maxim, because otherwise it would not have been possible to save Akari. But he caused quite a lot of trouble, and Kurando is not going to take it in a positive way. Nevertheless, he can't say that there are no other escape routes left, warning that he will go even into the desert if need be. Kurando asked his interlocutor not to make that face, because he also considered her a victim. However, he urged him not to forget his promise, not to reveal to anyone that he was a summoned one to take that fact with him to the grave. Besides, there was nothing else to worry about. At least, that's how he lived his life, because he had something in his past that he had to remember. Akari asked for permission to find out more about it, but Kurando cut him off. Suddenly, a cat-faced girl burst into the cave. She noticed the snow leopard and tried to pounce on the beast, shouting that she would definitely pet it. But Kurando soon carried her out of the cave and handed her into the hands of the leader. Orphea apologized, imagining Minya to be an overly curious cat. The woman ordered her to introduce herself, but Kurando countered that he had already heard her name. So he introduced himself and then introduced Yukishiro. The cat again asked for permission to pet him, but he explained that it was better to ask the leopard himself. Suddenly, she was down on all fours and purring something in Yukishiro's ear. Orphea wondered if they were both speaking feline, 
but the giant reminded her that they were from the same family, so suggested it might work. Corando asked the cult leader if she was an elf, and Orphea confirmed the guess. She explained that they were also called forest dwellers, but still elf was preferable. He assumed that she was skilled in magic, and the woman stated that it was natural, since it was the elves who first began to use spirit magic. Corando asked about autonomous magic, but Orpheus suggested that ordinary elves were not very skillful with it. Still, she had learned a thing or two in her long age. In that case, the young man rejoiced, and earnestly asked to be trained while the cult stopped. It would be great to know the techniques of autonomous magic, so Corando promised to receive guests if Orphea agreed to the arrangement. The elf wondered if that was really enough, and even promised to teach more spirit magic, and even life, because until everything starts the follower basically has nothing to do. She repeated that she would teach the boy the three sources of independent magic slowly, and Corando did not object. Maxim stated that magic was certainly a good thing, but it would be better to discuss the hunter's association. Akari explained that the followers of the moon goddess were not just hunters, but the only organization besides the parliament and the central government that could influence the association, regardless of the political situation. The followers always help poor people from different countries to destroy monsters. Orphea confirmed that the cult has a long history. It participated in the creation of the guild, which is the predecessor of the association and even supported it during the chaos. Akari went on to explain that they have no mandatory audit or punitive powers. The strength of the followers is in respect. There is no organization that would not give the cult a word. It is said that the mere rumor of followers can draw hunters from all over the country. Orphea said that even though the cult doesn't get involved in politics, it doesn't mean they're sitting idly by. She promised that anyone who desecrated Akari, and thus the cult, would be punished. Anyone who touched the body of the goddess would be frozen to their fingertips and then ground to powder. Orphea, however, said that she had to help now, so she offered to talk a little later. After waiting for the leader to leave, Corando shared a strange sensation, as if he felt a strong pressure for a second. Maxim awkwardly admitted that he wasn't the only one who had felt it, but Akari said that it wasn't surprising, since Orphea had been leading the cult for a long time and was even considered the strongest in history. She had saved civilians in that terrible world war. Truly a holy woman. The giant asked not to be surprised by such a strong excitement of his friend because she is a real fan of history. Now Corando at least understood the reason for Akari's mood swings. After wandering around the cave with her two charges, Orphea could not contain her amazement at the unusual life and interior of the mountain dwellers. Corando explained that the dwelling was even too spacious for two, and that Yukashiro would have his own bed in the future. Finally, the woman said that she wanted to introduce the boy to the two girls. Dianthea of the Crystal Earth Race and Ari, a representative of the White Race and deputy leader of the cult. The girls noticed that the young man was arbitrarily interpreting the rules of the association and also arbitrarily using them, which was equivalent to disregarding forced orders. Orphea agreed that proof was needed because otherwise those nasty guild guys would get off too easy. In that case, Corando started rummaging through the closet and showed the follower a copy of the order form, which surprised the guests because nowadays almost no one keeps these papers. Unable to tell the truth, Corando explained that there was just something interesting on there. Orphea decided to first familiarize herself with the text of the document and then asked the guy for his hunter's badge. The woman whispered to the subject to show his tracks as a sign of trust. Corando admitted to feeling something strange again, so he assumed it was autonomous magic, but the deputy women explained that it was a special chant to read the tag. Orphea stated that there was no mention of hunting, except for the very first record of collecting herb balls. Corando queried if there wasn't even a memory of hunting with Elata, telling her that the giantess had been his handler and some of the tasks they had done together the woman confirmed that there was no record of any, but one could ask Elata herself. Orphea ordered one of the girls to go to the city at dawn with Maximus. She concluded that the enemy was very cunning, so one must not show him weakness. The next morning, as agreed, Orphea met with Corando to train him in magic. To begin with, she clarified how he had trained before. The boy admitted that there was nothing to do in the winter anyway, so he held out a book to her, explaining that he had been learning just from it. The elf couldn't believe her eyes, for she was actually holding an encyclopedia of ellipse magic written by herself. Orphea told how about 150 years ago, 
She had been asked to write a textbook, but it was a bit too much. So the book was rewritten, leaving only the essentials, and at the same time changing the title and author. Corando inquired as to the reason for such drastic action, and Orphea revealed that she had written about the rarest of rare phenomena as the war raged. The book also described autonomous spells, spirit magic, and many more complex types. The royalty and aristocrats received pressure from the elves, and eventually the textbook was confiscated. Nevertheless, such things happened quite often, so now copies of this book lay somewhere in editions, but praise the guy because he had studied it quite well. In that case, she assumed that Corando knew the base, but he admitted that he had no experience at all in using autonomous magic. Orphea assumed he didn't even know the source, but the young man remembered a baron talking about a magic arrow, magic specifically for the hunter. It is activated by the environment, but you can only use it once. So you have to purchase arrows to shoot as many as you need. Orphea concluded that it would be more convenient with experience. So she asked what three autonomous magics Corando wished to learn. The first one he named was self-destruction, but the elf countered that it was impossible right now as one would just need a huge amount of magical power. In that case, he called Poison Barrier and Release. Orphea remarked that those were rather specific skills, but the barrier would not work without an opponent. Nevertheless, she realized how determined Corando was, so she stated that she would teach it as it was a promise, but cautioned against abusing these techniques and also asked him to keep it all a secret. Corando noticed that tonight was unusually quiet, though a while ago that would have been commonplace. Orphea couldn't get enough of the rock paintings and pictures authored by the owner of the dwelling himself. Suddenly, the woman bowed to Corando and declared that she realized she was an unexpected guest here, but thanked the lad for welcoming her and all the followers who had come with her. He objected that it was just a coincidence, and in general, it was his own fault for believing the giant's empty promises. But Orphea asked him not to blame Maxim, reminding him that she herself had asked him and therefore the responsibility was also hers. Corando stated that the truth could not be changed, but the woman noted that the truth was not always the truth. The guy agreed that it might be true, but no one would guarantee that nothing bad would happen. And when it did happen, it would be too late to sort out what was true and what was true. Orphea objected that Maxim was not that kind of person at all. He showed regret because the two boys were living all alone in the mountains. In that case, he asked if no one would be sorry when he was killed. The woman wondered if the guy really wanted to leave the rest of the world behind and stay in the mountains forever. He ran his hand thoughtfully over Yukashiro's soft fur and said that would be nice. He'd become convinced that you couldn't take promises at their word, but he still asked his interlocutor to keep what she said a secret, though he didn't understand why he was relying on it again. A promise that would cause problems. If it is not kept, it will be possible to hate the person with all his soul. It was one of the most effective ways to extinguish emotions before killing. At least, that's what he had thought before. Nevertheless, Orphea went down on one knee again and swore by her own name that she would never tell anyone about this conversation. Next, she uttered some rather long elven vows, the gist of which was that Orphea would keep the secret even on pain of death. Corando admitted that he didn't really understand everything she said, but the important thing was that she keep her promise. She laughed, admitting that she had never thought of having to say those words, for in fact, it was a marriage vow. The entire hill was littered with corpses and body parts of fallen hunters, with a huge spiky spider towering over them. Suddenly, the earth itself opened up and a monster crawled out. As it turned out, this story gave us no small surprises. Finally, we see the main character not as a super strong man, but a man who is going for it, and he is doing well, but he can still die from an accident or from a stronger monster. Let's follow the release of new parts together, because there is a lot of interesting things waiting for you. What do you think about this manga? Write about it in the comments. That's all for now. See you later and bye bye.